Professor Niprath, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We'd love for you to tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement in our current online 90-day study, because you've just got such a great vision for the, the scope of the study, and then talk a little bit about uh, the subject for today, which is monarchy and avoiding the pitfalls of monarchy and lessons learned by our founders. Well, thank you, uh, Kathy, and uh, uh, thank you for having me on once more. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think I've been associated with your wonderful program for uh, uh, over a decade, it seems like. Uh, and uh, this year, once again, uh, you know, we are, uh, through your, uh, uh, your efforts here, uh, able to present a, a study of issues that affect our uh, political system, our, our constitutional uh, system, our understanding of uh, how political systems, uh, especially ours, work or sometimes don't work, what the visions of the founders were. Uh, this is an, a very exciting and important project, and uh, it's uh, wonderful that you're able to continue this year after year. Uh, this year, uh, the, the topic is really basically on uh, looking at various other constitutional systems, uh, why they arose, how they operated, and uh, uh, what uh, especially our framers saw as uh, problems, uh, pitfalls with those systems. Uh, and how they at least tried to address those issues. Uh, uh, some of those uh, issues are uh, seem to be universal and throughout time, and uh, the framers recognize that oftentimes that this is an experiment. And uh, you know, if you read the Federalist Papers again and again, uh, especially Madison is telling us, uh, don't expect perfection here. Uh, don't expect that this, this, there are no guarantees here. Uh, as Franklin said uh, uh, to, to his interlocutor, uh, when she asked him what kind of a government they had given, uh, the framers in Philadelphia had given uh, the people, and he said, uh, a republic, if you can keep it, uh, remembering the fates of so many uh, republics that had gone before. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. Um, now, on the topic of uh, monarchy, uh, here, uh, a monarchy, and uh, many, many political philosophers consider monarchy sort of the original form of government. And um, it's one of the classic forms, along with uh, uh, aristocracy, and then I'll, I'll just call it democracy. Uh, the uh, uh, monarchy means the rule of one. Uh, and uh, we have a sort of image of a king or a ruler of one, and a king being a very common form of ruler of, uh, of um, ruler by one, uh, that the, the, you know, the king or the queen, as the case might be, uh, performs certain ceremonies, uh, carries dogs around uh, under his or her arm, tends to horses, uh, and, and lives in wonderful palaces and castles. Uh, or alternatively, uh, the king is someone who bosses everyone around and probably wears a T-shirt that says, uh, because I'm the king, that's why. Uh, uh, so th those images do have a, uh, there's a stereotype uh, that, that has a core of truth or a kernel of truth like most stereotypes do. Otherwise, we'd have other stereotypes. Uh, but uh, the matter is much more nuanced. Uh, the origins uh, some uh, anthropologists, some political theorists attribute to monarchy is basically that in primitive, among primitive, primitive humans, uh, the one who was the physically uh, strongest uh, just took charge, uh, similar as to uh, other, some other primate groups at least. Um, but as human society uh, evolved and uh, became more sophisticated, the whole notion of uh, monarchy uh, became more nuanced. And if you, if you uh, read the classic writers on the topic, they oftentimes, they'll talk about monarchy, but then they'll change the name slightly to something like kingship. Uh, kingship carried with it other, uh, other meanings. Uh, uh, for example, uh, kingship was not always one person. It was not uncommon at all. Uh, in classic systems uh, to have more than one king. Uh, Sparta, uh, the early uh, pre-Republican Rome kings of Rome, uh, typically where there were two of them. Uh, and there's a reason I'll briefly talk about why that's important. 
Uh, some had, uh, again, Sparta at, and part of its history. Uh, the kings were governing really with in a council uh, the, uh, uh, of Gerontes, uh, of the, the old people, uh, right? And uh, uh, to some extent, these, the, these councils are advisory, but they're also to keep an eye on the king. Uh, now, sometimes a dual kingship, uh, interesting reasons for them. One uh, was uh, uh, perhaps because of military necessities. So in Sparta, one king would be at home, the other one would be, you know, holding off the Persians at Thermopylae. Uh, the, uh, uh, there was also another uh, reason for it, that there oftentimes were rival families. And there's a, in, in Sparta, the, the, the historians believe that there were two rival, big rival families or clans, and one king was selected from each of those uh, uh, families. But another aspect of this was that it, uh, uh, allowed the kings to keep a check on each other. And if you look at some of these uh, uh, dual monarchies, uh, that stands out. And the framers, Alexander Hamill in particular, in the Federalist Papers, gets into uh, uh, the discussions uh, about uh, the unitary executive that the framers set up versus having dual monarchs or dual executives or multiple executives. Uh, and what, the, what he saw as the, the, the problems with those kinds of systems. Um, kings oftentimes also performed non-governing you know, roles. They were oftentimes judicial officers, high judicial officers. Uh, they were, uh, th that still remains with us, for example, in the pardoning power. Uh, the um, uh, kings oftentimes performed religious ceremonies. They were chief priests, as it, uh, as it were. Uh, so uh, uh, the kingship uh, meant more than simply, you know, sitting on a throne and telling everybody uh, what to do. Um, another issue that came up in the context of monarchy or kingship uh, th throughout history is we think of... If we look, for example, if, if uh, when the queen dies and uh, may she live a long time uh, more, uh, that the office is going to descend to her eldest son. Uh, and then uh, when he dies uh, to his eldest uh, son, although today it's the eldest child in, in, in the British monarchy, um, that there's this automatic succession. Well, that's not how things necessarily worked. Early kings, the origins of monarchy, oftentimes these kings were elected uh, to deal with one of the problems of monarchy, at least modern monarchy, uh, that the framers were concerned about. Uh, and that is uh, the quality of the ruler that's going to appear. So these kings were oftentimes elected, typically for life. That was the case in Sparta. That was the case in Rome. Uh, that was the case of uh, even with uh, many of the, of the Roman emperors subsequently, uh, they, the succession was not natural born children necessarily, but people that they adopted uh, and that got into the office that way. Uh, the Holy Roman emperors were elected by the nobles. So uh, they were, they were, there was not an automatic succession. That said, like most people, the kings wanted to, uh, to, to, to pro provide for their families and a continuity of the privilege and position have it uh, uh, descend to their, to their successors within the family. Um, uh, Madison in one of the essays uh, talks about the tendency, broadly speaking, of people, not just kings, uh, to want to pass on their offices uh, uh, to, 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 to others uh, that they designate. So this is, this is a common thing. And th these dynastic impulses eventually led many monarchies uh, to be hereditary. But it's not a foregone conclusion that every uh, king, every monarch uh, would be hereditary. Um, as I said, the, uh, the, the, the process of election was quite a common way uh, to uh, become king. Now, there are certain benefits uh, to a system of monarchy uh, that, uh, again, Hamilton discussed in the context of our unitary executive, uh, accountability uh, in office. 
uh, right? Uh, if, if, if you've got a large group of people involved, they tend to, when things don't go well, tend to try to blame others. But the king uh, is uh, symbolic, is up there and is going to be blamed uh, for bad things that happen and also get the benefit of good things that happen, uh, whether or not the king is ultimately really can do much about it. Uh, there is the, the uh, energy in government. Uh, one person making a decision is much easier than when you've got bodies trying, committees trying to get things together. And so the, the, the energy in government is important. The legitimacy of the government in the person of the king. Uh, this is a very common phenomenon that uh, the, 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 the people identify with the king. One of the problems that the Americans had at the time of the revolution was trying to demonize George III because so many people identified with George III. They had erected monuments in the United, in, 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 in British North America uh, to George III. Uh, George III was very popular with the, with the English people uh, because of his youth and his, his, his dynamism. Uh, he wasn't the crazy old guy that you know, sometimes portrayed when he was you know, 30 years older uh, than when those events were happening. Because, so many Americans too identified with the person of the king. Uh, so the, the king re represents legitimacy in his person. Um, and even today, that's the case as long, for example, in England, as long as the monarch merely reigns and doesn't uh, try to rule, I suppose. Um, some of the disadvantages, of course, with a monarchy is if the king decides to rule. Uh, so much depends upon the king's character and intelligence and political ability and, and, and really all around wisdom. Uh, it's all depending ultimately on that person. Yes, he's going to have advisors. Yes, he's going to have uh, uh, people that uh, uh, may uh, uh, support or oppose him, but ultimately uh, that's the decision maker. And it so much depends on the quality of that decision maker. Uh, the problem of uh, isolation of a single ruler. We talk, you know, there's a lot of news coverage about Vladimir Putin being isolated uh, from uh, uh, the uh, things that are going on uh, because he's this absolute ruler. Well, that's the problem with the monarch, too. He's going to be isolated. Uh, he, he's not mingling with the crowds, as it were. Uh, he doesn't get a sense of what's really going on. So that's a problem for a decision maker. Uh, the pomp and circumstance that arises with the, the ceremonies surrounding the royals uh, that uh, puts them in a different reality and sometimes causes resentment among the people that they see this clear class difference uh, that can stoke resentments. Uh, if the monarchy is hereditary, the problem of family degeneration uh, over a period of time uh, that uh, um, you're, you're, you're it's in the quality, you're no longer the warrior that uh, the, you know, great, 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 great grandpa was. Um, and uh, if there is a, if there is a, a hereditary, a set succession, um, if you run out of heirs, uh, because uh, the uh, king doesn't have direct descendants. And this creates succession struggles that make you know, elections uh, uh, look like backyard barbecue. Uh, so uh, these, uh, there have been plenty of wars over succession. Uh, you know, one that just pops uh, into mind is the invasion by William the Conqueror of, of England, uh, based on some dubious claim to the, to the English throne. Uh, so you, you, you have these succession crises uh, when the family line runs out, and it inevitably does. Um, now, I want to just make one more point and then, then, then open this up to your comments and, and, and questions more specifically. But uh, going back to Aristotle for a moment, uh, this relates to what I said about the quality of the king. Aristotle distinguishes formally between a king and a tyrant, right? Monarchy for Aristotle was the best form of government because of the advantages that it could create through a good ruler. But like with all systems, there was an inevitable corrupt form and a degeneration. 
and that would be tyranny, which to Aristotle was the worst form of all governments. Uh, and the dis difference was between what he classified as royal rule and the rule of a tyrant. Royal rule was the rule of someone who put the interest of those uh, uh, whom he governed uh, first, the general welfare first, and himself last, and uh, uh, governed with a uh, sense that, that, that he had been given an office in trust, not for himself, but in trust for others, whereas the tyrant was there to satisfy his own passions. Uh, so, you know, drawing on sort of human psychology more broadly about how humans should behave and how they often do behave, uh, he transferred that to the, the good ruler, the royal ruler versus the bad ruler, the tyrant. Uh, and those would, that would seem to encapsulate the advantages of monarchy on the one hand and the disadvantages on the other. Well, that is a... That is a fascinating start to our discussion. And thank you so much for that overview. I wanted to just talk for a second about, uh, you know, our country's history with monarchy. And it, it seems that we've got a real love-hate relationship with monarchy. When, when I was doing some research for this show, I came across something that I'd never known before, that right before the Constitutional Convention, I guess in 1786, a, a representative of the U.S. government, the president of the Continental Congress, Nathaniel Gorham, wrote to Prince Harry, who was the younger brother of the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, and invited Prince Harry to become king of the United States of America. And I had never known that our country had actually offered the monarchy to someone. And I, you and I were talking a little bit before the show about this. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how that happened and, and what, what ended up uh, happening after that offer was made? Sure, the, the, the concern was uh, that uh, the, with the sort of um, rivalries among the states that were uh, seen as uh, threats to the union, uh, that uh, some, uh, somebody was needed uh, who could, in a sense, uh, uh, both impose a stronger government, uh, but also act as a kind of symbol uh, of, uh, of uh, the new country. Uh, as, as a kind of regent. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, Prince Henry was the younger brother of uh, Frederick II, Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia. Um, and uh, uh, Frederick was one of this group of, of nobles, uh, of kings that uh, historians refer to as enlightened despots, uh, 18th century enlightenment infused uh, uh, absolute rulers. Uh, Henry was the sort of the, the quote unquote liberal, and I don't mean in the current political sense, uh, but the, the uh, sort of Republican with a small r uh, uh, member of that family. So he was uh, the most suited for the office if the United States were going to have a king. Um, uh, you know, there is a lot of talk that Washington, you know, could have been king if he wanted to. And who knows if there were feelers made to George Washington and, and, and Washington simply said, yeah, I'm not interested. Uh, I don't know that. But um, uh, apparently Prince Henry mulled the offer over. And while he was mulling it over, uh, the Continental Congress had a change of heart and withdrew the offer. But Gorham wasn't acting simply on a, apparently on a personal whim. No, he was acting, it sounds like, on behalf of the United States government, which was really interesting. Or, or at least some faction uh, within the Continental Congress. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I guess the Anti-Federalists, when they were arguing against our U.S. Constitution, were one of, one of their main arguments, it seems, was that the executive was too strong and that we had been given a monarchy. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. That was a constant refrain uh, that uh, the president's powers were were uh, too strong. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a there's a certain validity to their claim, their concerns. Uh, you know, this is not the 
it was a fairly common topic among writers since then about the potential powers of the presidency. Right? Uh, in one of the opinions of the Supreme Court, because I'm familiar with that area of, of government, uh, uh, Justice uh, Frankfurter was writing uh, about executive power and said it's very clear that the scope of executive power in the Constitution, to a great extent, depends upon the willingness of a strong executive, and I'm you know, paraphrasing this, uh, to use it. Uh, because as it's structured, there is potentially a lot of power in this executive form of government, which we have. Uh, our, our president is not elected like a, the prime minister of England is elected through a parliamentary majority, uh, and then governs as with a cabinet form of government. Uh, the president is the chief executive. So Hamilton spends a fair amount of time uh, in the Federalist Papers in the roughly mid 60s, 66 or so, uh, through uh, 75 uh, at least, uh, discussing uh, the, the uh, uh, scope of the powers of the president and trying to tamp down those criticisms, those objections from the anti-federalists, uh, oftentimes comparing the powers of the president to those of England and to the King of England and making them uh, the president sound a lot less powerful than the, than the monarch was. More effective, uh, I think, was his argument, were his arguments that uh, comparing the powers of the governor of New York or other governors of states to what the president could do, for example, in relation to the veto power uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so it, all of it intended to, to, to say, look, the president really isn't in any uh, more powerful position than your governors are. And if you're okay with your governors being Republicans with a small r, uh, then you should be okay with the president. Right. The, the, the one point he made, though, that I found interesting, especially in relation to monarchy, uh, was that he said one of the dangers of the presidency uh, of, an, of an elected president uh, versus a monarch is that a monarch is so tied to his culture and has so much stake in the government that he's likely not to become a tool of a foreign government. But we cannot say the same thing about someone who's elected president, comes from more middling circumstances and knows he's going to leave office after some period of time, that he's much more likely to fall uh, prey to the blandishments of foreign governments. Uh, you know, we've, we've certainly heard times when presidents have been uh, at least accused, uh, perhaps quite wrongfully, of a foreign collusion. Interesting. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Tova, who I know has got some great questions. Great. Um, thank you so much. This is, you know, super fascinating. Um, I was wondering how the monarchy system in Europe, uh, like European kings, kind of compared to monarchies in other parts of the world, um, are they kind of like similar systems and ideas or are they are they very different? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about, you know, the, the how the uh, monarchy in Thailand, for example, or in, in, in Japan operates. I, so I, it's I really can't talk about that. I can talk a little more generally. Uh, and as I said before, uh, monarchies or royal type governments uh, can come in many different flavors. They can be dual monarchies, uh, uh, king plus council models. Uh, they can be absolute rulers, uh, in, in, or as in England, what we call a constitutional monarchy. That is a limited monarchy. Uh, the, the, the queen has uh, only ceremonial roles as a practical matter. Now, let's take the case of the veto. Uh, power that the president has, for example. Uh, the uh, king uh, and the queen theoretically has an unlimited power veto, not a, not a limited power as our president has. But no veto has been exercised by a British monarch since I believe 1715. So if, if the queen were to actually try to veto something today, uh, I think <laughs> there'd be a lot of controversy, let's put it that way. Uh, 
so there, there's, but there are certain patterns to monarchies. Uh, and and uh, that, and, and one of the interesting patterns to monarchies is that even if you start with a strong monarch, sooner or later, because there are rivalries within the political structure, you get families or, or, or uh, other wealthy individuals, but I'll call them wealthy families, it's sort of the history, that seek to control the power of that monarch. They inevitably arise, uh, competing centers of power, typically in uh, other families, whether we call those families dukes and, 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 or counts, or whether we uh, call them uh, something else, senators in Rome. Uh, or, uh, you know, the Gerosia, the Garantes in Sparta, uh, inevitably some other centers of power develop to try to control the king. That seems to be a, an, an inevitable path in a, in a monarchy, an aristoc whether we go to aristocracy or whether we go to a broader Republican type system. Thank you. Um, and then it's interesting to me that Interesting to me that while England still, at least kind of the name has a monarchy, um, you know, the US and France really rejected that. So I'm curious uh, why you think that England was able to, you know, keep their monarchy and still today kind of function as a democracy. Whereas like, why do you think the founding fathers felt that America couldn't continue under that system? Yeah, it was a grand experiment, right, uh, that uh, our founders uh, set out uh, to do. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, there's this, and again, we can talk about, you know, philosopher, ancient philosophers or political theorists uh, that uh, down to modern times that talk about changes and evolutions in the government uh, to some extent or other. Uh, if you read Plato, if you read Aristotle, you read Polybius, uh, they all talk about stages that governments go through. Uh, so if you revolt against the king because you don't like the king, uh, king's government, you're not, you, you may not set up another king. Uh, the families may, uh, that revolt against the king may set up an aristocracy, which degenerates into an oligarchy. Well, then the people uh, through their leaders get stirred up, the unsuccessful families uh, stir up the people, and we replace that with a democratic system of sorts. Democratic system inevitably, inevitably degenerates into mob rule, which uh, threatens property rights and individual rights. And chaos results, and we're back to a tyrant. So uh, it, it, uh, there's a sort of evolution. So the, the Americans, uh, despite Nathaniel Gorham's efforts, uh, were not going to uh, have another king. Uh, so they set up a system uh, that uh, served their needs uh, at the time, that was palatable uh, to them. There was no in, uh, in, uh, you know, sort of hereditary aristocracy uh, in this country. Uh, so uh, that was the next best form, a type of aristocracy, because voting, oftentimes voting qualifications were imposed and qualifications for office were imposed oftentimes. Uh, at the state level uh, to reflect uh, that uh, government shouldn't just be handled by anybody. There should be uh, some qualifications, uh, government by the best, as it were, or the better, let's put it that way. And then there's inevitably a democratization process that happens in societies, including in the United States, as the vote was expanded uh, uh, continually. But, you know, uh, do we have a system where a republic or democracy can survive today if so much depends in classic Republican systems upon the sense of community that we have for each other. Um, are we too big for that? Are we going to regress towards some kind of uh, government by a powerful leader? Uh, but uh, that's, uh, you know, I think it was simply politically unpalatable to have a monarch uh, in, the, in the 1780s. That makes sense. Um, I'm glad they. I'm glad they thought that way. I like democracy quite a lot. Um, so but, but notice, I, notice, Tova, that that as a people, we seem to crave the pomp and circumstance of a monarchy. Uh, think about what uh, you know, British coronation versus our inaugurations and compare our inaugurations to the inauguration of Washington and Adams and Jefferson, okay? Uh, 
uh, we, we substitute others. We have a passion for knowing everything of, about certain celebrities. And I'm not sure that's a, those are better idols to follow than you know, the, the, the Queen of England. Uh, our very interest in the Queen of England, what, what she's doing and those royals are doing. Right? So there seems to be a popular craving for this type of you know, identity. That's true. I think we always seem to raise certain people up above others in our mind and want to kind of put attention um, and focus onto them. And I think that just who, that, who those people are changes with the values of society. And I think as kind of the flow of information has become more globalized and universal, whereas like before the king only got to control information. Now, I think we can kind of have more choice in who we choose to venerate, but I think you're definitely right that there's like an impulse um, to kind of centralize towards somebody we like hold above ourselves or at least trust to make sense of the chaotic world more than we can. Um, maybe that's the root of it. But I was also curious, you know, the US and France both had revolutions against their kings um, pretty close to each other. The US is, um, was more, I think, it ended more peacefully, whereas, or more, I guess, yeah, more, you know, whereas France was like very chaotic and lots of turnovers, I guess more, more stable is what I was alluding to. Um, so could you talk about the reactions to monarchy in the US versus France? Um, did they both have sort of the same objections or were there kind of differences culturally or politically? Um, and then why did, why did the revolutions end up differently? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, that, those, those are questions that have, uh, have uh, occupied historians uh, for a couple of centuries, right? Uh, why the difference? Uh, uh, one difference might be in who uh, were the leaders of, uh, of, of those uh, revolutions uh, and what, how were they framed? The Americans framed their revolution as a conservative revolution. I don't mean that in any kind of political sense. I mean that in the sense of that the Americans argued they were simply protecting the ancient rights of Englishmen and the ancient structures, uh, constitutional structures, that they accused the British monarchy of having upset uh, and saw the British monarchy as radicals, uh, that where they, the Americans, were preserving the culture. Uh, the American Revolution was controlled by, uh, by, by um, uh, a landed, if I want to call it that, landed aristocracy and merchant aristocracy. They were not a formal hereditary aristocracy, of course, but those elites. Um, uh, so in, in, in France, that wasn't necessarily the case. For one thing, they were reacting uh, in a revolutionary fashion, increasingly so, initially, slowly, and then increasingly so. Uh, there, there were a lot more intellectuals uh, and uh, lawyers uh, leading the French Revolution uh, uh, than sort of landed aristocracy. Another thing is that, look, England's a long ways away from the Americans. All right, the, the Americans are pretty much controlling their own affairs already uh, for quite a while. That was one of their, 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 the friction points uh, that uh, they thought the British were trying to reimpose royal authority. Whereas in France, the king was right there and the nobility was right there. So it was more that it reached a breaking point and now we've got to get rid of the king altogether. It wasn't something where we can just sort of say, all right, we'll see you later, you stay over there, king. And we're just going to go our own way. Do you um, think that the all U kinds of reasons. do you think that the um, U.S. Uh, War of Independence would have had a more uh, violent end for King George if he had like been in the U.S. versus like all the way across the sea? If if there had been the same conditions, probably that that, that might well have happened uh, with if they had been more proximate. Uh, you know, one also has to look at, you know, how were the different, the kings viewed, um, uh, you know, and as I said, uh, uh, um, King George was into this, well into the 1770s, quite popular in the United States, among the Americans. Uh, 
So I, I don't know, uh, but it stands to reason that uh, there would have been a potentially different result. Wow. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. I appreciate your very insightful answers. And I'll, I'll That's pass always to good question. Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> it's a great show. The, uh, I'm trying to construct my questions, um, make them concise, but it's a really, it's a really broad topic. Uh, not so much broad, but it contains huge ideas uh, within it and um, not something that is spoken about as much. Certainly not in like, uh, it's, it's not this, these concepts aren't really discussed in civics classes or, or when you go through school, you just learn about what they are, but you don't go much deeper. And normally you just hear this thing's bad, like monarchy's bad, democracy is good. And then it's the end of the idea. So I have a, a one question first. Is that are there are there uh, distinctions, uh, formal distinctions made between monarchies that operate with a parliament or without a parliament or with other checks on the king's power? Um, I think you probably understand my question, but yeah, yeah. So uh, it's there's a degree, obviously. Uh, so. Uh, we can think of uh, what we might call absolute monarchs in the early modern period, uh, that is the 16th and 17th centuries. You think of, uh, 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 to some extent, Henry VIII, uh, 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 Elizabeth I, James I in England, uh, uh, Louis XIV in particular in, in France, uh, Gustavus Adolphus in, in Sweden, uh, uh, the various Russian czars, these absolute monarchs. Um, then we have a different system where there's a, 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 a thriving uh, uh, other, uh, well, there are thriving other centers of power where the king is still the ruler, but he has to deal with these various politicians and these other uh, political centers of power. An example of that would be the uh, uh, German uh, Empire, uh, Wilhelm I, and especially Wilhelm II. Uh, where there were uh, who were not absolute rulers by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and then you have these uh, rulers like Queen Elizabeth uh, and most modern kings in the West uh, that uh, reign but do not rule. Uh, they, we sometimes refer to the, uh, them as uh, constitutional monarchs, uh, but that same name is oftentimes also given to monarchs like Wilhelm II the, 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 the of, of, of Germany. Uh, they're constitutional monarchs because of these restrictions that operate on their power, these other centers of power that effectively control them. And that's a very common development in monarchies, as I, as I mentioned before, because people get jealous, people seek power, and if there's only the king, right, they're going to find alternate centers of power. And one of the things, you know, in this project here that we're doing in this 90 day study, uh, at least how I approach it, uh, is to show how there were these alternate centers of power that inevitably developed in these systems. So we, so, so some historians describe George III, for example, uh, or the Georges in England, uh, that uh, group of kings, as Republican monarchs. Uh, Montesquieu, for example, uh, did that. Uh, you, uh, uh, you can describe systems that had nobles in charge as republics. Because why? Because they also had competing centers of power that checked each other. Ultimately, the concern is, in uh, government is how do we prevent absolute power from arising? Right? And, 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 that, and, I, can compete. and that brings me to an interesting thought, which is that the American Constitution's government does have ideas within it that all men are created equal, meaning that no man would then have a right to rule. But that works in total uh, as a, a, in total pairing, like as a total marriage with the idea that man is endowed with inalienable rights. We see many democracies and republics 
which don't share the idea of man having inalienable rights, which the government has no right to infringe upon. So would we ha not have more in common with a monarchy that had some form of bill of rights than a democracy or republic, which did not? Uh, that is an excellent and profound uh, comment and question. Uh, as you know, the Greeks, going back to the Greeks again, as they recognized early on, uh, democracy is a corrupt form of government because it inevitably becomes mob rule. There's no guarantee in a democracy that your rights are going to be protected. The history tells us otherwise. If you read James Madison, uh, Federalist 10, about his comments about democracies uh, and, and their turbulence and chaos uh, and the threat to people's rights, it's the point you're making. It it's, goes broader than having a democratic system. So we talk about a republic. Uh, and by that, we oftentimes mean a balanced type of system that tries its best to combine the power to govern, as Madison again identifies in Federalist 10, with at the same time protecting the rights of individuals. Uh, there's no guarantee in a democracy, right? The comment about democracy is uh, two wolves and a lamb deciding what's for dinner. Uh, that's perhaps unfair, but it's not a guarantee of rights. Um, now about your point about equality, uh, all, all, all uh, persons are created equal, all men are created equal. Uh, one has to recognize that the framers meant that, and Jefferson meant this as a sort of metaphysical concept, that uh, uh, in the eyes of God, uh, for example, in that sense, we all have an essential humanity. But it doesn't mean that each of us is equal in talents, uh, equal, equal in sentiments. Again, read Madison in the Federalist Papers. Uh, <laughs> you know, it tells us that, that that doesn't happen in reality. So uh, democracy is a system of ultimately some kind of majority rule, but it doesn't guarantee that the majority is a wise one or a tolerant one to respect individual rights. That has to come from other limitations. Thank you very much. I'm sure we have some great audience questions now for the last 10 minutes, uh, but it's been a great podcast, so thank you. Well, thank you, Jewel. And we do, we've got some great uh, audience questions and comments. Uh, John Chambers, uh, going back to our, our, when we were talking about the difference between the French Revolution and the American Revolution, John Chambers has a great comment. He says they ended up differently because the constitution of the people, the Americans, recognized the importance of government, as he says, the British constitution, while the French wanted freedom with no idea of what to do once we get it, which may summarize that up pretty well. And then uh, Noel, well, let me actually, let me go to uh, Sharon Tate's had a, a, an interesting comment. She, Sharon says, I never heard, I never heard that before about an offer of a kingship for our country, how different things would have been. I can't imagine the United States as a monarchy. Uh, and then Noel uh, Tokarev wants to go back to something that Toba said. Um, Let's see, he, where did that go? He had said, I wonder if we lost that. Basically, Noel was talking about uh, asking, you know, we, we talked a little bit about why uh, the American Revolution or the French Revolution ended up so differently, but why do you think that the English have been more, were more successful with their monarchy than the French? Why did, why were the French not able why was their monarchy not as successful? Uh, probably historical accident. Um, the the, uh, the uh, uh, reaction in, in, in the 17th century in English constitutional history, uh, things were up for grabs. It was not at all clear uh, that uh, what was going to evolve was the kind of constitutional monarchy of the 18th century. Uh, the Stuart Kings and the Tudors before them were, were certainly uh, absolute monarchs or tried to be absolute monarchs and the English Civil War uh, ended up in a sense settling that. Uh, you have the restoration of Charles II and then eventually the Glorious Revolution uh, where you have the 
Parliament gaining ultimately, really the House of Commons, gaining ultimate sovereign power in England, uh, a process that had taken several centuries. Uh, it's uh, you know not clear that had that parliamentary victory not happened uh, against Charles the uh, First, those 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 uh, skirmishes and battles, uh, that uh, the English monarchy would have evolved necessarily that way. Now another way to look at it is that the tendency in England was much greater to that extent because England's merchant class, its bourgeoisie. Uh, was much more numerous because the uh, English outlook as a naval uh, nation, an insular nation towards the, out other, uh, the outer world was different than France's view as a continental country, primarily, uh, less commercial oriented, uh, more, ins more ice, I don't want to use the word insulated, but uh, more insulated, let's, let's call it that way, uh, in its outlook. Uh, despite its, you know, desire to get colonies in Africa or where have you, uh, that that affected uh, the the nature of the government uh, and the evolution of a constitutional monarchy in England uh, versus uh, that that would not have happened as readily in France. Well, thank you, and I, I want to correct myself. That question came from Vincent Romano, so um, thank you, Vincent, for that question. And then uh, Noel Tokarev actually had a comment. He or sort of a also a question, he said, do we crave the glitter of monarchy because we're created to live under a king God? And, you know, that's that's a, a point of our human nature, always longing for, for a, a higher power in some way. Um, Eric, uh, Eric Braverman writes, the dialogue from press to politician seems to have deteriorated from the principles of a higher power common to the US founding documents, in other words, proclamations of fasting and thanksgiving routine, what is the best way to return to more meaningful leadership and more inspired public based on virtuous character shaping our decisions from commercial enterprise to professions, from courts to Congress, from president to cabinet? I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, I can say this, uh, that these kinds of concerns about uh, uh, really in a way uh, social degeneration are not new. Uh, you, know, you read critics, uh, satirists, commentators in ancient Athens, the concern was that. In Rome, this was a major concern. Uh, one of the big goals of Octavian uh, was to try to make Roman society less immoral. Uh, and all the efforts he undertook in that direction, which uh, may have worked for a few years, and then things go slide in a different direction again. Uh, so it's, it's a cultural matter that I don't know that, that there's any particular thing any particular politician can do. It's the basic idea, look at yourself first and, <laughs> and deal with yourself. And, you know, if, if, if we do that, but it could also be a confluence of events, right? Uh, emergencies arise, uh, you know, we've had good times. Uh, if things go really bad, oftentimes people return to more fundamental uh, issues, including fundamental values. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to say, um, but the old question, does a virtuous government create a virtuous people? Do virtuous people create a virtuous government or is all of that a pipe dream? You know, that debate's been going on for a long time. Very good points. Finally, Robert Zimmerman says, this may be jumping forward too much, but the executive orders granted to the president under the constitution seem monarch-like. Why does Congress not say no to these or at least move them to the courts when obviously wrong or going against treaties already made with other countries? Yeah, the issue of executive orders and executive agreements is a very interesting one because uh, uh, it, uh, out as basically, uh, you know, carrying out sort of almost ministerial matters uh, that not, you know, Congress can't address every, in every detail in a piece of legislation. Uh, and then they become, once they're accepted, then the executive is going to push it a little bit more and then push it a little more, push it a little bit more. Uh, 
And suddenly executive orders, executive agreements, uh, you know, we don't do treaties anymore because it's too difficult to get it through two thirds of the Senate, uh, as this, uh, John Kerry uh, said a few years back. Uh, so we do other kinds of agreements, including executive agreements, uh, you know, under the table, non-agreement agreements. Uh, so yeah, this sounds very much like a monarchical government. Is this the evolution that naturally happens as society becomes more complex? Ultimately, right? Self-government depends, I have to go back to Aristotle, to the notion of friendship, that it's a form of friendship where we agree to do things for others, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of others. What Madison described as the issue of Republican government versus factional government. Uh, and it gets difficult to think of that type of system when we're dealing with 300 plus million people. Um, a member of Congress represents almost three quarters of a million people on average. Uh, that's not a community. So it gets very difficult to avoid people simply looking out for number one. Uh, and, 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 and that undercuts Republican government. Well, thank you. Um, and we are just about here at the end of our time. And I wanted to just check back in with uh, Tova and Jorn and Jewel and see if y'all had any parting words. Uh, Tova, any, any last comments or questions? Well, just thank you so much, Professor, for being on. Uh, we appreciate your, your time and your expertise and have a great week. My pleasure, yeah, as, thank as you. always. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we may have hit one of those important questions that um, many other ideas follow from. So appreciate the discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tova and uh, Jewel, for your great questions. And we want to invite everybody back next week when we're going to be talking about avoiding the pitfalls of dictators. We are just we're working our way through history and different types of governments and comparing uh, these different regimes and types of governments, uh, juxtaposing them with our country's founding principles. And it's just been a fascinating few episodes. So, Professor Nipra, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for all your great work in helping us design uh, our current online 90 day study. Thank you for having me and uh, hope to see you again. Well, thank you. And thank you to our audience for all your great questions. And, and we look forward to seeing you back next week. Thank you. Thank you.